Today's lecture is on Buddhism. Now, I love talking about Buddhism, but I know I say that about every topic. But before we get started, I have a couple of quotes. The first one is from Buddha, and it says, in the end, only three things matter. How much you loved, how gently you lived, and how gracefully you let go of things not meant for you. Uh-oh, Tim. This is the one I struggle with. Okay, the other quote I have comes from Albert Einstein. He says, the religion of the future will be a cosmic religion. It should transcend a personal God and avoid dogma and theology. And he goes on to say that it's Buddhism that answers this description the best. Now, I usually tell this little story about Buddha. Towards the end of his life, there were a bunch of monks gathered around. And they started asking him questions. They asked him, are you a God? And he says, no. Then they ask him, are you an angel? He says, no. Are you a saint? He says, no. So Buddhism isn't about worshiping Buddha. Then they finally ask him, what are you? And he says, I am awake. And he's not talking about, I went to sleep last night and woke up like all of us did. He's talking about, when did your ass get woke to the struggle that's happening here on planet Earth? Because some people don't get woke. And I'm all about being woke, and that's why I talk about the Matrix, because Morpheus, the god of sleep, comes to wake Neo, the newbie, up. That's what the whole movie's about. Okay, enough about that. If I go into Siddhartha, this is the guy we call Buddha. He was a wealthy prince. His dad was a king. He had just about everything. You don't have to remember any of this for the test, so I'm just giving you an idea about when he was around. And in his late 20s, he saw four things. They call them the four passing signs. Like, oh, shit. It's like there's a corpse and he saw and like someone that was racked with illness, so on and so forth. And he saw his own lifestyle that was really privileged and cushy. And he saw that other people around him were struggling. And so he decided to leave home to seek the truth. This reminds me exactly of St. Francis of Assisi, but I think I have one right here. Yeah. Anyway, that's for another day. So he moves through these three phases. I don't expect you to remember this part either. The first thing he does is he goes and he consults with the Hindu masters of the day. That should draw some parallels towards another person, which is Jesus. We'll get back to that when I talk about Joseph Campbell. Okay, so he, w he wasn't impressed with that. The second thing he did is go join a group of ascetics. What is ascetic? This is a person or people that deny themselves worldly pleasures like good food, good clothing. They may fast and starve themselves, things like that. That's why he almost died. And then finally, he entered to a period of meditation. And he specifically did this meditation under what they called the bow or the Bodhi tree. And so here he is under the Bodhi tree, and here he suffers three temptations that he must thwart before he begins his ministry. Hmm, who went into the, oh, not the forest, but the desert, and suffered three temptations that he had to resist, get thee behind me, Satan, before he started his ministry? There's these parallels about these divine beings. I'm going to save that for another lecture, okay? So anyway, when he arises, he's enlightened. And then for the next 45 years, he preaches to people a new way, a new way, right? That challenges the society of the day, the Brahmin society. And then he dies around 483 BC. Okay, that gives you a little bit of backstory on Buddha. I hope that makes sense, but you're not responsible for that part on the test. In this next section, I'm gonna go through some basic Buddhist beliefs. The first thing that I wanted to address is the Four Noble Truths. This is one of the biggest ideas from Buddhism. Number one, life is suffering. <laughs> the good news about suffering, it only lasts a lifetime. <laughs> okay, so that's one thing that's the tenet of this. If you think life is not suffering, then you're going to miss out. Now, where does suffering come from? It comes from craving, desire. So desire is big in the Buddhist tradition, or at least focusing on that aspect of human beings. Number three, good news, it can be overcome. And how do you overcome it? Through the Eightfold Path. So I'm gonna show you the Eightfold Path here in just a minute. Okay, so I wanted to focus on the suffering and craving thing for just a second. I know I did a bunch of drawing on that one right there. This is from Lama Yeshe. When Lord Buddha spoke about suffering, suffering, he wasn't referring simply to superficial problems like I'm sick or my arm hurts, you know, because I hurt it in a basketball game. It's the dissatisfied nature of the mind itself. Oh my God, this is me. 
Ah, uh, no matter how much of something Tim gets, it never satisfies Tim's desire for better or more. Oh my God, three would be better than two. And then it's like, this is why I have an addictive personality. Everything's addictive. I don't care if it's gummy bears, I'll get addicted to them. And this unceasing desire is suffering. So desire is causing the suffering. Okay, so I have a little movie clip. I'm gonna play it on this next slide, then I'll come back. But basically it's someone recapping this exact thing that I just talked about. The fear of loss is a path to the dark side. I won't let these visions come true, Master Yoda. Death is a natural part of life. Rejoice for those around you who transform into the Force. Mourn them do not. Miss them do not. Attachment leads to jealousy. The shadow of greed, that is. What must I do, Master Yoda? Train yourself to let go of everything you fear to lose. Okay, this is the Eightfold Path. This is the method to rid yourself of suffering. So here it is. I made this little thing up. I don't know if it will help you, but this is how I remember it. Visa Limsy. Now, I know that sounds stupid, but I made it like this. What's the V? Right view. Oh, yeah, life is suffering, but it can be overcome. So that's my intention. I want to overcome suffering. Well, right speech, action, livelihood, and effort, those are all about what I say and do. Now, I'll go into this, the power of the word, later, but if your speech is off, like Tim, you talk shit about yourself, it's going to be hard to attract the right people. Or action, what do you do? That's karma. Livelihood is what I'm big on. You better pick a job that coincides with your spiritual purpose here on Earth. I know that's not popular, but that's the way I preach. And the effort, always do your best. doesn't matter. Okay, I'll get back to that, but then in the end, mindfulness and concentration is what do you set your head on most of the time? What do you meditate on? What do you worry about, or what do you praise? We can come back to this, but I do like this. Why do I have this, like, whatever? It looks like a steering wheel from a boat over here on here. Well, this is the Dharma wheel, and the eight spokes represent the eight paths, eight pieces of the path, I should say. And so Dharma wheels are kind of like compasses in a way, too. And so that's kind of like I have this right here is kind of a Dharma wheel and a compass right here. Okay, enough about that. Now, if you want to know more about Buddhism, I really love this guy, Thich Nhat Hanh. If you go to any bookstore or go online, there's a million things he's done. He's very digestible, very simple, peaceful, loving man from Vietnam. Now, another idea from Buddhism, I'm going to just bring in a few terms here, is Nirvana. This is one idea I have a problem with. Not nirvana per se, but it does come from the word to extinguish or to blow out, snuff out. And so the idea is that you reach this indescribable bliss at the time of your death, you know, reach nirvana, but then you become a non-entity. Like they don't, I don't really believe in an individual soul, which is kind of weird, but I don't like the idea that when I get snuffed out that my soul doesn't go on, whatever. Reminds me of that new movie, Soul, but I need to go and watch it. Okay, so after Buddha died, there was a big split. Just like after Christ died, after all these other people died, Muhammad died, there was splits. It's like, oh my God, that's not what he meant. And so there's two, there are actually three kinds of Buddhism I'm going to mention. Mahayana is the big raft. Buddhism for the masses. You don't have to remember this for the test, but big raft. Hinayana is the little raft. This is where you go and retreat and become a monk, you know, alone in silence. So there's components of both of these, and there's two different words I want to introduce right here because it relates to somebody you should be thinking about. One is arhat. That's the individual that retreats and seeks perfection. So that's Hinayana, little raft. Bodhisattva is somebody that has reached perfection, liberated themselves, and chooses to go out and liberate other people. Well, you got to be around people to do that, Mahayana. And guess who does both things? His name is Jonathan Livingston Seagull. He retreats to seek perfection, but he also goes back to, after he sought perfection, to liberate other birds from the flock, Bodhisattva. You following me? Okay. So, 
Anyway, Buddha says, if you have set out to be a bodhisattva, you should decide, I must lead all beings to nirvana, into that realm of nirvana which leaves nothing behind. You're completely free, emancipated. Now, so some bodhisattvas just do it for a lifetime. Some say, I'm going to just stay here until the end of the human race, you know, millenniums, until, you know, everybody is free. Okay, so the third kind is Vajrayana. See, Yana is on all of them, the Diamond Way. And so the Diamond Way is when you do it in one lifetime. Most of the time we have to reincarnate a bunch of different times. We talked about this in Hinduism to get it right. But some people do it within one lifetime. Guess who does that? His name is Jonathan Livingston Seagull. It says it right in the book. <laughs> Some of us, it took 10,000 lifetimes, it says in the book. But for you, Jonathan, you're a one in a million bird. It took you once to learn the lesson. So some people can do the video game in one time. This is usually where I talk about the Dalai Lama in class. And I would show you a lot of movies like interviews with the Dalai Lama because he does come from the Diamond Way. He's the 14th supposedly reincarnation of Buddha. That's why I don't understand the whole soul thing. How does Buddha get reincarnated 14 times if he doesn't have a soul? But I don't know. Ask Dr. Valley about the technicalities on that one. But anyway, back to his name, Dalai Lama. It literally translates into ocean monk. What does that mean? Well, supposedly he's so compassionate that he has the compassion of a whole ocean, unlimited amount of compassion. And so that reminds me, I have it right here. I don't know if you can see it. Oops, this way, Sacred Heart of Christ. It kind of reminds me of that same idea. Okay, so when they asked the Dalai Lama, what surprises you most about humanity? He goes, well, man himself. Why? Because he sacrifices his health to make a bunch of money. Then he gets old. Then he has to use that money to get his health back. And then he's so worried about the future that he doesn't live in the present. And as a result, he lives as if he is never going to die. When he dies, he never really lived. Wow. That's why I love Dalai Lama. He's so like next level. He's such a compassionate man too. Okay, so usually I talk about the Wheel of Life. This is the last thing I want to talk about uh, for this section on Buddhism. And the Wheel of Life is this cycle of suffering. Samsara is the cycle of suffering. So what we do is a stream enters, we enter the wheel. And so then we go round and round and round on this Wheel of Life. And it might take us many lifetimes, just like from Hinduism. And then there will become a lifetime where we can exit the stream and never come back again. Okay, so enough about that. I just want to talk about certain aspects of the wheel or the cycle of suffering, which is samsara. If you look at the wheel and I blow it up, there are two paths you can go by. But in the long run, there's always time to change the one you're on. That sounds like Led Zeppelin, right? So this is like the dark path and the light path. So you can go the path of bliss where you walk towards the light and evolve, or you can devolve and go down into the darkness. You can go up or down, just like with reincarnation. Now, the other thing I usually talk about is this middle part. There's these three little animals that kind of help spin the wheel with the help of this demon, Maya, in the back. And they're called the three poisons. So here is what drives suffering. The first thing that drives suffering is the boar, our ignorance. So the pig represents ignorant. He's just going to eat, 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 and he just doesn't know that's not going to make him happy. And a part of that ignorance is he doesn't understand desire or craving for these things he attaches himself to is not going to fix him. So he just eats more and more thinking it's going to fix him. This sounds like drug addiction. I'll just smoke more weed or crack or whatever else it is and it'll just fix me. But then what happens is you just can't get to that place anymore. And you get mad and frustrated. But because you're ignorant, you just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. And it keeps spinning the wheel until you get out of this cycle of suffering samsara. Okay, so Ramona Anderson says people spend a lifetime searching for happiness and peace. They chase idle dreams, addictions, religions, even other people. The way I look at it, the other thing that I talk about, I think it's one of these worlds down here. There's six different worlds and 12 different things around the circle. But one of the worlds right over in here is called the realm of the hungry ghost. And in this world, people, just like the, the boar, 
they're ignorant and they're these ghosts I and mean, if it, like you're a ghost as they eat food and they they taste good but it won't stay in their stomach it just falls right to the floor but they can't stop eating because it tastes good and they think it's going to satisfy them and this is an analogy for us and how we do things in life money shopping food sex it tastes good while it's going down but it just never seems to stay in your stomach and just keep you full for a while and that's why i'm really big on like talking about idolatry and that doesn't mean I'm saying you do it. I'm talking about me. You know what I mean? Because if I idolize drugs or money or sex or whatever it is, then I'm making that God. One time, one of my friends, he's died now, but he asked me, Tim, what do you spend the majority of your day thinking about? I was like, I don't know. He goes, well, when you find out, that's your God. Because that's what you meditate on all day long. and It's what you really want to have. It's like, dude, that sucks. You know what I mean? Because I don't think about God 80% of the day. Now I think about him a lot more than I used to. So I'll end up with this quote I showed earlier. And Oh, I forgot I had this on here. False prophets, follow me and you'll be happy. It's like whether it's sex, drugs, this, that, or the other. I showed this on the first day of class. But this is the quote. The dissatisfied nature of the mind itself is suffering. That's it. Take it. I mean, if you've been through any 12-step programs, they talk about restless, irritable, and discontent right there. No matter how much of something you get, it ain't going to fix you. Because all these things are from outside. And we'll get into lectures about the fix later on. Okay, I hope you like this lecture. I really like talking about Buddhism. Next time, we're going to go into Taoism.